On this week's edition of InCycle, we reminisce with former winners of Milan San Remo. The first moment when I realized that it's possible to do a really good result was just on the last 700, 800 meters. We look at the rise and decline of one of the greatest sprinters ever, Marcel Kittel. It makes no sense in the end to compare yourself uh, yeah, to other records because you're, yeah, you're special in your own way. But first, we catch up with Philippe Gilbert. Gilbert now, look at this. Big attack from Philippe Gilbert of Francais de Jeu. He's such a talented bike rider, Philippe Gilbert. Really turns the heat up on everybody else. I was always uh, turning my race philosophy to attack. Uh, this, was, this is what I like, even if sometimes it's too difficult, but you still try and uh, you see that no one is motivated to try, but you still go and then you bring people with you and uh, you know, you, you start the, the fight. Very simple, he's gritting his teeth, really piling the pace on. Sometimes it's hard to be the first one to do it, but when you start it, then it's, you, you create a different race. Gilbert will win the 63rd edition of the Hetvolk. Gilbert takes the prize. That was a spectacular win. When Philippe Gilbert burst onto the scene in 2008, it was only the prelude to many more great wins to come. Yeah, I won uh, really nice races like Stage in the Tour, uh, San Sebastian, Amstel, uh, Flanders. Every time I won this big monument, it was in a way like really aggressive, you know, um, big selection before, the best guys of the day in the final, and then uh, at the end, I managed to win. And uh, when you can win that way, it's, uh, it's really nice, you know, because you can win also a big race just waiting to sprint and beating the, the guys. But I don't think it's the same feeling, you know, when you do that. Look at Gilbert. Well, this is what the crowd wanted. It's the Belgian champion on one of the iconic Belgian hills. This is what he came to quick step for. He wanted to fill in those Flemish holes in his very well-rounded palmarès. When you really build uh, the race and turn it in your way, and uh, Eddie can manage to win, that's, uh, that's uh, something different. It's another level, I think. Philippe Gilbert, the Belgian national champion, one of the most aggressive, enjoyable and dramatic races in the history of this race in recent years. Gilbert raises his bike over the line. After claiming the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix in his time with De Kern in Quickstep, Gilbert has returned to rivals Lotto Soudal to strive for the fifth and final monument. You cannot say before the start I'm going to win, you know, it's uh, San Remo is still like even 10 k to go, even even if you feel good, you're not sure to win. Vincenzo Nibali is flying up the road. Like uh, the other classics, like 10 k to go, you know pretty much that you have a big chance to win. Uh, because this, the, the selection is made and there's only a few guys left and you can feel if you're better than them or not. But San Remo is like 10 k to go, it's still like 80 guys together fighting and uh, maybe 20 of them can win. Nibali is within sight of the finish line. And Alaphilippe hits the front, Nason trying to get on turns. It's a bit like uh, playing on the lotto, you know, you, you, you have your numbers and you hope that they are the right ones. And here comes Alaphilippe to another famous victory. I'm not so confident about San Remo because it's, I know it's difficult to manage and, and control everything. With a three season contract, the 37 year old has time yet to tick San Remo off the list. In doing so, he'd join an elite trio who've won all five monuments. Rick Van Looy, Roger de Vlaeminck, and of course, Eddie Merckx. Uh, I think it will be a nice day to stop cycling, but uh, with the contract uh, signed, uh, I think it, uh, it's worth it also to go keep, keep, keep racing, you know? I think if I do that, it will be like uh, only three people did, did this, uh, these five wins, you know? And uh, three Belgians from another time, you know, it's a long time ago, and uh, I think it's really hard to realize the impact that this will have. And uh, of course, we're talking about the dream, 
and uh, a goal, but it's really hard to make it happen. Even without La Primavera on his Palmares, Gilbert's attacking style will leave an everlasting mark on the world of cycling. I'm thankful to this people because uh, I feel the support, you know, uh, and not only when I win, but also when I have bad luck and everything. I have a lot of uh, messages, support also next to the world, and it's always nice, you know, but yeah, uh, I just do my best, and uh, I remember just myself when I was younger, and uh, I used to be fan also of the riders who attacked, because I think they make the race uh, attractive, and uh, at the end, any sport on nice when they are really played 100%, you know, and to play 100% you have to make it attractive. And cycling to make it attractive you have to attack. So I think the attacks are like a key to make people happy. Milan San Remo, the longest test of cycling's great monument races, is one that has always fascinated spectators and riders. With racing on hold for now, it's a good opportunity to look back at some of the recent editions of the race with the help of the men who raised their arms in celebration of winning La Classicisma. The 2013 race is one that has been long talked about, if not for the result, but for the extraordinary conditions that hit the peloton. We got the information that the race will be stopped at a, at a certain point, which was, I think, 135 kilometers or something. It was really strange, but yeah, getting into the bus and taking off the gloves and warming up a little bit, that was, was actually the worst, because when, when the fingers warm up, it's so painful. When you head over the, the podium and you feel that you stay in the first group, then it's... Uh, yeah, the first thoughts were just to, to stay upright in the descent because it was super slippery, it was a dangerous descent. And I think the, the first, or actually yeah, the first moment when I realized that it's possible to do a really good result was just on the last 700, 800 meters. Despite being yet another brutal edition, 2014 followed the classic San Remo model of a reduced bunch finish. That would prove an ideal situation for Norwegian strongman Alexander Kristoff, who survived the Poggio with the help of teammate Luca Paolini. I did the first half half well, and uh, I was with Luca. And then um, the last part, I threw these small corners and the small road. I, I lost a little bit of position, and um, yeah, it was over the top, I think it was quite far in the back. But on the bottom, I see Luca really in the front looking for me. And then he's waiting, waiting, and at the end I come up to him. And yeah, from there on he did an incredible, incredible job. At the end, I think I was just the guys, guy that was most fresh or had the most power left, but uh, because all the sprinters were there, they were had a free clear shot, but uh, I could uh, overpower them at the end. After bunch sprint wins for John Degenkolb and Anna Demar the following two years, some had begun to wonder if a strong sprint was all it took to win San Remo. The 2017 race would do much to show that was not the case. Heading to Poggio, we have two cards to play, uh, which was me and and and. Uh... And Elia for, for the sprints, but in that moment, you know, Sagan decided to to have a go, and then he was, you know, he was his attack was quite impressive. Peter Sagan's stinging attack had created the winning group. As the trio headed onto the Via Roma, all expectation was on the then world champion to finish the job. Kwiatkowski had other ideas. Kwiatkowski's there. They punch up. Kwiatkowski. Oh, I can't tell you. I cannot tell you at the line. Crossing the finish line, I was not sure if I, if I won, and then I just wanted to wait until the final result because uh, you never really know, you know, for the finish, more, you know, much more than than us riders. When you're winning such a big race, it always uh, brings you, uh, you know, crazy and, and and good emotions. The following year, a home favourite would again use the race's final climb to claim a famous win. 
il poggio e essendo una salita molto vicina all'arrivo bisogna stare molto attenti e quindi la funzione da stopper in questo caso avrebbe avuto molto più senso e eh, io ero un po' il jolly anche della squadra abbiamo preso proprio il poggio forse in seconda o terza posizione con, uh, con Moric e il mio obiettivo era quello di muovermi nel caso ce ne fosse stato se si fosse mosso Kiatowski, Peter Sagan o altri nel momento che c'è stato questo attacco io mi sono subito mosso, mi sono detto oro mai più e quindi ho provato a fare la solo e è venuto veramente una cosa spettacolare. The story of Marcel Kittel's career is one that climbed the highest peaks and plunged to the deepest lows. Kittel now, beginning to open up his sprint, he hits the front, the big German goes! The German sprinter shocked the world of cycling almost a year ago, stepping off the bike at the age of 30. Drag to the line, and here comes Kittel! Cycling was confronted not for the first time with the enormous psychological pressure it puts on its poster boys like Marcel Kittel. I think I actually really realized that I um, yeah, maybe could have the talent um, to become a professional cyclist uh, when I won the first time the World Championships in the Juniors in the time trial. That's a moment where you yeah, start to believe in it more and more. You're still maybe not sure if you could make it, but um, at least it's the first good step, I think. I always needed someone who gave me that yeah, little kick to, to really go for it. And um, that actually happened then when I came uh, to Skishi Manu uh, in my first year professional, where, where the team said, OK, we, we also still believe that you are a good sprinter. And yeah, from there on, things changed again, uh, away from the time trial more to the sprint. Kittel progressed rapidly once he stepped up to the top level. After winning his first Grand Tour stage at the 2011 Vuelta, he backed it up with his first big one-day race the next year, Schilderbris. Tyler Ferrari knows his finish, here comes Cattell over the top. Tyler Ferrari and Cattell, Taylor Boss on the right. Marcel Cattell, here comes Cattell down the zone. Guardini is up there, Tyler Ferrari and Cattell throw the bike of the line. It looks like Cattell takes it for Argos. It would be the first of many big wins for Kittel over the coming three years. His four stage wins in the 2013 Tour de France placed the then 25-year-old firmly at the top of the sport. Of course, I, uh, I see and I know and I feel that um, people expect this year more, or maybe the same at least, and uh, that they are also more quick disappointed and um, I'm aware of it but it's not that I'm riding now on my bike and I think oh, damn, you really have to you have to do something you know they are expecting now I don't know four stage wins again or whatever that's not my ambition and that's not uh, clearly not the goal for this is to the France. Goal or not Kittel would win four tour stages again in 2014 and it didn't end there. Giant Shimano fighting to take control, all around Marcel Kittel. And Kittel comes to the fore, the big man! Kittel straight through the middle of the minute. And here comes Kittel! Oh, he takes it on the line! It's going to be Kittel, Kittel by a long way! Oh, there's none bigger at the moment, out of absolutely nowhere, like a bolt of lightning, he delivers, what a guy! The following year would prove to be an annus horribilis. In a season plagued by illness and injury, Kittel could only add one race victory to his tally. Well, you doubt everything. So uh, I think that's, that's also quite normal for someone um, like me. In the years before, I was always used to winning. Everything was going smooth. I never had a real big injury or something. Um, and uh, yeah, then there was that year 2015 and nothing uh, was good uh, anymore, like I was used to it. And yeah, then, then you start to, to think about it, of course, um, and ask yourself, yeah, why is that now? And how can I get it uh, right again? By the end of the season, Kittel and Giant Alpecin parted ways. 
Luckily, he would find refuge with one of the godfathers of modern cycling and a team renowned for delivering wins. Yeah, How the sensation is? At the moment, not good. Before was better. <laughs> no, it's all right. Good times on the bike with the group. I understood, of course, as an old fox. Uh, that we had to be very prudent with them, and I think I did a very good move to say, listen, Marcel, it is not interesting if you're winning or not. You have to find back your uh, your pleasure in cycling. We brought them to Dubai. We, we said, we're going to try a sprint. If it's okay, it's okay. If it's not okay, don't worry. He won the first race. He won the second race. He won the GC, and he was back. Awesome. I'm really, really happy, seriously. I was uh, yesterday dreaming already about this moment uh, and I really, really wanted this. With Etik's quick step in 2016, Kittle showed he was still the best sprinter in the world. It's Kittle versus Cavendish on the left look out the right, it's Kittle all the way, Cavendish is there. Marcel Kittle makes history, he's the record man in Skelda Prey's history. I think, still think that he was probably in these years the fastest rider in the bench. Power-wise, I think he was he was one of the best. Uh, he, had, he had a lot of power, which he needed because his, his aerodynamics wasn't that that good. I mean, uh, he was a big boy, so once he got out of the saddle, he took a lot of wind, but he he, he had the power just just to build up the speed with it. And then at that period, I think he was he was the best. He really, yeah. He had a, that acceleration, but also the distance to make it. He could easily go from 300 and then he kill everybody. <laughs> 2016 turned into his best season yet, but with the glory came a return of media interest and even more pressure. As a sprinter, you, you always um, have a have pressure when you when when there is a stage that you can maybe win or a race that you can win so you have a lot of moments and opportunities to to go for a victory as a person you just sometimes need moments to yeah that you have for yourself um, at races of course it's it's more things now that that come together there of course the expectations to perform good um, as a rider there but also um, people would like to interact with you. They would like to get in contact. To they, they, yeah, they would be happy if you get, if they can get a signature or anything, or a picture. So um, you try to find a good balance between it, and sometimes that's not easy, and sometimes it's also too much. Yeah, I got I got numbers in my jersey pockets, um, so it's yeah. It's crazy. One guy tried to sell his sister to me, so it's really... People are sometimes actually awkward uh, with that, but um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I try to do it as good as possible, but sometimes I also just need my moments um, where, I'm, where I'm not up for it and I just want to have a yeah, private time. Kittel continued his good form in 2017, which he again started in Dubai. Another five wins at the Tour would follow, bringing his grand total to 14. I, I do not race for any records. I don't want to, to, um, yeah, to, to set records. And that, I mean, if it happens, of course, I, I would be very happy to, to reach a certain amount of, I don't know, stages, but it's not that... Um, my priority. I mean, for me, like I said before, the process of getting to, to a highlight like the Tour de France, for example, is much more important than uh, and making it successful in the end than, um, than finishing my, my career with a certain amount of stages. I think that's then, that's the first moment then, actually, when you finish your career, to look back on, on and maybe sum it up and um, calculate what you actually achieved. And maybe it is a record, maybe not, but 
I think it's not the way how we should uh, judge about a career if it was successful or not. His team, however, had another sprint talent waiting for his moment in the spotlight. It's opening up dead centre. This is going to be a phenomenal win. What about that? Kabiri gets it up the line. Four stage wins in his first Grand Tour. What a phenomenon 22-year-old Fernando Gaviria yeah. is. With Gaviria in the ascendancy at quick step, Kittel left for Katusha Alpesin in 2018. Despite two early season wins at Tirreno Adriatico, all was not well. This is Marcel Kittel with a mechanical. And sometimes we know that in these situations, it doesn't cope particularly well. Oh, Kittel, it's gone to his head. Cannot keep up with the man in front, Niels Pollitt. Oh, goodbye, Marcel Kittel. He will not be winning a 6 scale de Brest today. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Not a day for Marcel Kittel. I was very sad when he left the team. Uh, and unfortunately for him, he did a very wrong choice to go to Katusha because he came from a very well-structured team to a team who was losing a little bit the direction. In his last season, the German would win only one race. In May 2019, Kittel and Katusha Alpesin parted ways by mutual consent. That August, he announced his retirement from the sport. When I will finish my career in, in some years, um, and then I, and, and, and if I look back then, then um, I will see if I was capable of it. I, I do not compare myself also to other riders. I think everyone is, is special for, uh, in his own way. And um, of course, you, you see that also in the victories. So um, for me, it's also, it makes no sense in the end to compare yourself. Uh, yeah, to other records because you're, yeah, you're special in your own way. That's it for this edition, but do join us next time. Until then, keep up to date on social media.